cascading down information and data and results to teams has got to be better, yeah. right? It, it They may not think, doctor owners may not think that assistants or hygienists are interested in those things. They are. Mm -hmm. they, they are. This is Growth in Dentistry, a dental intelligence podcast where we ask the question, what does growth in dentistry mean to you? I'm Steve Jensen, a data dental nerd and your host. Welcome, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Steve Jensen, the host of the podcast, and I am super excited for our guest today. As always, before we jump in, I want to give a big shout out to the marketing department and to Dental Intelligence for sponsoring this podcast and bringing consistent quality content, data back content to the industry for you guys to learn and to grow. Uh, their offer, as always, for those that are new and for those that have heard this before, if you haven't checked out Dental Intelligence yet, come and check it out. Go to get.dentalintel.com slash podcast, and they'll give you a $50 gift card just for coming and doing a demo. If it's been a while since you've checked out DI, we have had a ton of sweet releases this year, customized scorecards that we just released that are in beta, but people are loving them. Uh, we They have visuals we just released there. So a lot of cool customizations that are coming out, as well as workflow tools. So check it out. Like I said, 50 bucks uh, just for doing a demo. Now, without any further ado, I want to welcome... Craig McVeigh to the podcast. Craig has been a consultant for over 17 years. So this is uh, uh, this is not his first rodeo. He's been doing this for a long time. As I've gotten to know Craig, we just recently met. And as I've been getting to know Craig better, I have been very impressed with the way that he approaches running a dental practice. Um, not only has he been in consulting, but he's also the COO of a dental group out of California. They've grown so far from one to four locations. So thoughtful growth, meaningful growth, which I think speaks volume in today's market. It's a unique situation we're in where market pressures have slowed down private equity money coming into the space. So we're not seeing as much of this like land grab transaction happening and growth is being forced to be more about how do we do it profitably and thoughtfully and doing it in a way that while speed does matter, we like speed and growth. What matters more is that we're growing in a meaningful way, a sustainable way. So I'm very excited because Craig has some really impactful thoughts, I think, that people can take advantage of. Now, uh, Craig, is there anything else you'd share about yourself? Let the audience get a feel for who you are. I've been, been impressed. So welcome to the pod. Thanks, Steve. And thanks so much for having me on here. Uh, other things, um, you know, we talked about, my background is not in dental. My yeah. background is in, in, uh, in business. <clears throat> so um, got my MBA. Um, my uh, certificate, professional certificate, human resource management. And I believe that kind of lends to me having or being able to look at a different perspective. Mm -hmm. When I look at a business from being on the outside, uh, I do tell, you know, clients I work with, a group I work with, you know, half the time I'm working on the practice, really the other half of the time I'm looking at patients, their reactions, their behaviors, and and how can we then you know, reduce the barriers for treatment, um, reduce, reduce the barriers for appointments. So um, I, I believe that perspective helps me a lot to be very objective in how I bring things to the table. So a uh, hundred percent agree. I love that perspective. Now let's set let's set the stage this way. So what I've been observing, you know, I'm listening to a lot of voices in the market. I'm seeing some of the financial pressures that both private practices and groups are experiencing. And there's been a lot of focus, especially in the last two quarters of 2023, to really uh, tidy up the way that we're spending money, some of our financial habits. And it's it's not a bad principle, right? This belief that, hey, every dollar I can save in expenses uh, reduces the amount of production I have to make by, you know, whatever, two, three bucks that you call it, because we only take a percentage of the revenue. So I'm not saying that's like a bad strategy. Like, I think we always should be mindful of spend. We should be good stewards of the money coming into the business to make sure that our expenses don't get rowdy. However, I think there's a lot of really meaningful things that folks are missing in this hunt towards cutting expenses. And I think you've got some really interesting thoughts. So let's start the stage there, Craig, from your perspective, both in the consulting space, as well as as a COO that's very well connected with these kind of operational tactics. What are some of the things you're seeing? Let's start with some of like the basic suggestions. What what things might people be missing out on, you know, uh, as we consider what to do in 2024? I would say the first thing is, you know, knowing 
the results of what you're doing. Hmm. So I started using analytics probably in 2019, 2020, um, when it became more prevalent and, mm -hmm. and there were platforms that were useful. Okay. And um, if, if, <laughs> if doctor owners inspected the key, the main key performance areas of their practice, as much as they look at their bank account, okay, <laughs> then yeah. they will have a real idea of how to drive growth in their practice or where they need improvements. And it's hard if you're trying to pull reports from a PMS, that's not going to give you a perspective of, of what you need to know, not so much on a daily basis, but definitely at the very least on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. If, if they have goals and most doctors have goals, well, I want to be 10% more in collections that I was, that I was last year. Okay. Well, what's going to drive that in your practice? What is your case acceptance uh, data, right? Mm -hmm. What is your new patient growth over the last year? What's your production per visit? Does that need to be increased? What's your hygiene capacity look like? So if they don't have that overall snapshot using a simple analytics program, then it's very, very hard to drive growth. Mm -hmm. You're not going to drive growth just with new patients because I've yeah. seen where they're oh, we got 70, 80 new patients, but what they haven't done is they haven't looked operationally whether they can handle 70 or 80 new patients. So yep. maybe that's not the key to their growth. So with analytics, they can look at the key areas that, that they can actually impact on a daily basis, they can have that at their fingertips. So analytics, I mean, within that case acceptance, I think is one of the, or the case presentation, how they have a method is probably one of the easiest, most impactful things they can do on their practice. Mm -hmm. And, and there's probably, you know, Steve, there's probably four to six different data points in there or metrics that you look up that make up what their actual case acceptance is. Yeah. In fact, so, I'll share this. Uh, like, I think it's, that's one of the places where doctors are always really surprised to see like what is actually happening down the line of case acceptance. And here's what I mean by that. So most doctors are pretty intuitively connected with when I present a treatment plan, roughly what percentage of patients are saying yes and scheduling or completing at least a portion of that treatment plan. So I, most doctors, you know, I go and speak all over the country and, you know, do these podcasts and webinars and most doctors are pretty good at guessing a pulse on that stat, you know, somewhere in that like 75 to 85% range is where most doctors right. fall. And, and we call that patient case acceptance. But what surprises doctors is that when you follow that all the way through, so you start the case and then the question becomes, okay, like how good are we as an industry at seeing that casework all the way through with these patients in a cohort example? And when I look at industry benchmarks, only 37% of the dollars on the treatment plans that are getting diagnosed when you follow it over a course of time end up actually getting completed. So that, that number always surprises folks where there's a lot of opportunity where like if the patient said yes to something, like there's positive momentum there that I believe mm -hmm. and based off of top performing practices, uh, we can get, we can get lots better momentum there. You know, I see practices getting 70, 75% of the dollars are diagnosing scheduled and completed. So I know it's possible. Um, but definitely requires, I love what you said, like, first, we have to, like, actually, like, track our performance to see, and basically, the idea, Craig, if I'm understanding right, is let's, that gives us a way to get, like, a, a benchmark of what are our current processes yielding, and then if we decide to make mm -hmm. some changes to our processes, it gives us an idea on, is that change positively impacting patient outcomes, or is that change neutral, or is that change negatively impacting patient outcomes, and if we behave more that way, we'll be way better off at articulating and engineering our success. Right. And it's, and you bring up a good point in order to drill down to find out what the issue is, we need to have data. We need information. Yeah, so cool. in your example, right. If a practice is at 27, 28% uh, dollars accepted versus presented, um, what is their, what is their patient finance options? How mm -hmm. good is their team at presenting third-party financing, which which now in the last two years, that landscape has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going from what we thought was, you know, what we accepted as four and a half out of 10 patients being accepted to now these companies 
are there's eight and a half, eight, eight and a half out of 10 being accepted because they've they've changed the industry. They've changed mm -hmm. algorithms. They've changed how patients can actually get help financially to, to accept treatment. But then beyond that is how well is their team? How good is their team doing presenting mm -hmm. that? So hey, let me add one more like, on the patient financing because I think it's important. So there not only have been improved like uh, financing vehicles that have been introduced into the market. And you mentioned some names like there's Sunbid and WiseTac. Cherry has been kind of coming in. And Care Credit, I think, recently has started to introduce. And they acquired a company to try to introduce a similar financing vehicle. Um, but you're seeing really strong consumer adoption of these, even outside of dental. So here's an example. Yesterday, um, I had to get my oil changed on my truck. And I also had to get the brakes fixed on the back. And while I was waiting in the waiting room, um, I'm kind of like walking around, looking at the signs of like tire tread wear and what engine oil filters look like when they need to get changed and that the stuff they have hanging to try to sell me on all these extra stuff. But one of the things they had was like this really cool organization box that fits in the back of a truck. And sitting mm -hmm. on top of that was this, this sign that basically just said, hey, there are you know, really great financing options to make this more affordable. And guess whose logo was on the bottom of that? Sunbit, right? So this same company we see coming into dental is like really getting into a lot of spaces and having a lot of success and consumers are very open to it. So it's something just to note, like if you're not making it easy for patients to pay for healthcare, someone else is making it easy for them to pay for that same dollars they want to spend, they are willing to spend. Someone else is making it easier for them to spend those dollars. So I think it's important to recognize from like a healthcare perspective, I think that if we can offer some of those um, financing vehicles, it really helps patients say yes to treatment and it's easier for them to move forward and invest in their oral health. So don't, don't be afraid to use it. And I agree with you on the whole like approval thing. Approvals have dramatically improved with these new mm -hmm. um, financing companies that have come to the market. So definitely check them out and get engaged with them if you're if you're not using those. Because approvals, like you said, yeah, have like over doubled with what we're seeing now. Sorry, go ahead. You, you were moving on to a different place and I wanted to give a an additional like layer that consumers want it. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're engaging with it. So don't be afraid of it. Yeah, I truly believe, I mean, especially post COVID, there has been a quote unquote Amazon effect. You know, consumers are different now and patients are consumers. We're consumers, our habits are different too. How do we reduce the barriers for parent, for patients to accept treatment? And, and you know, finance is one of them. So um, it, it's, it's a big thing to look at. And I've been really kind of studying it for the last year actually. And, um, and there's some good things out there for teams to learn. Tell, tell me, Craig, actually, let me just go one more because I've got like the Dave Ramsey on my shoulder, the Dave Ramsey screaming like, no, don't get people in more debt, right? So tell me outside of that, let's talk about like some positives too. Obviously, there's some downsides too to, to debt. We want to make sure we're doing good by patients. I think these companies have some pretty good things in place. There's some terms, you know, some same as cash terms. Tell us about your group maybe or some of your clients. Have you seen like measurable success in adding that in? Has it been beneficial to patients? even if it's, you know, some anecdotal feedback or stories, examples. Sure, absolutely. Uh, we have a practice that's in a very uh, prevalent area in uh, Southern Cal. Uh, they had some doubts, the team had some doubts about um, bringing on third party and it was Sunbit. Um, and within two months to two and a half months, uh, the admin team was able to capture right about $20,000 mm -hmm. in uh, approved contracts with Sunbit. And that that's, that's huge. great. You know, yeah. I look at that's that's money that maybe they're not accepting treatment there. So that in, in itself is is kind of our example now of, yeah. of how successful it can be. Yeah, that's great. In fact, like I, I've been looking, I've been kind of watching trends of financing and practices. And I think the average practice is only doing like three to six K in approved um, financing uh, every single month. So that's mm -hmm. awesome to see you know, more like 20K in financing coming through that clearly has an impact on on getting more people to say yes than previously have been saying yes with other more traditional options. So that's sweet. Um, let's move on and talk maybe. So some of the things we talked about, like, okay, we, we can cut finances, but then what are the things we look at? So one of the comments was made, the points was made from you, like, hey, like use analytics to really get a picture of the business. The way I always like to phrase that is as a dentist, like, there was a day when x-rays didn't exist 
and you had to like use a scaler and just the visuals you could see on the surface of the tooth to identify pathologies in the mouth. And what a phenomenal advancement to move into a place where you could get a full image, an image of the full structure of the tooth and adding 3D imaging into that with CBCT. Like we've made great advancements in our ability to get a full picture of the tooth, what's really going on and understand its structure and where it's weak and where it's strong. And I would talk, I like to talk about dental intelligence and adding analytics into businesses and dentistry in the same way. Previously, there was a time for the longest time in dentistry, we didn't have good tools to really get a full picture of our, of the health of our business. And these tools mm -hmm. allow you to really go from looking at surface level things like what's hitting the bank account, our production, our collections, or new patient trends, and really dive into the full structure of the business to understand where we're healthy and where we have some you know, business pathologies and restorations that need to happen. So definitely an advocate for that. Totally agree, Craig. Let's talk. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Let me, let me go to the next thing with that, because I think it's a good transition here, Steve. You know, I use, I use DI in all of my practices that I work with. I think you know that. Yeah. Um, and the reason I chose DI was that it, it's not an admin tool. It's not a doctor and owner tool. It's a team tool. Yeah. So this goes into kind of what I was going to talk about next. And that is, you know, cascading down information and data and results to teams has got to be better, yeah. right? It, it They may not think, doctor owners may not think that assistants or hygienists are interested in those things. They are. Mm -hmm. they, they are. And, and, you know, having the tools, you know, DI to me is kind of very, it's, it's very intuitive, easy for the team to use. And usually at, at first glance they're saying, okay, well, the admin team will handle this. Mm -hmm. And that's all of my, you know, almost all of my practices. It's not the admin team that really uses it as much as say the clinical team does. And that's really important. But my overall thought here is if you do have some analytics and some results and some data, you want to be extremely transparent with your team mm. and cascade this information down. You know, we talked um, before, uh, you know, like marketing, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, everybody markets, but what is the depth of knowledge that your team has about your marketing efforts and what you're trying to accomplish in your marketing? How many digital new patients are you getting versus patient referrals? Can, you know, patient referrals don't cost anything. So, mm -hmm. And we grow that. Absolutely. Absolutely. They can simply ask in a very nice way. And that's how you get patient referrals. It's free and it's easy to do. But if they don't have that information, nor if they don't see the results of their efforts, that's not going to get any traction. Yo, I totally agree. So there's, really a, there's a quote from Brene Brown, a psychologist, and she makes it so simple. She just says that clear is kind. And I think when it comes mm -hmm. to performance measurement in dental practices, so many folks like a hygienist or an assistant don't have a measurement they can look at to understand, like, am I being successful or am I not being successful? So the clearer we can be with our teams, it, it honestly is a much kinder place to be. There's another th concept that I love that just states that when expectations and reality don't equal each other. That's when we have conflict. And so if we don't have like clear expectations, measurable expectations, then the likelihood of us having lots of conflict or potential conflict in the business um, are dramatically increased. So I agree with that from that perspective as well, right? Like cascade the information down so that they have a clear image of like, okay, hey, why do these different things matter? You gave the example of marketing, like, like no one's looking, not no one, I shouldn't say that. I'm like an absolute statement police. So very few practices are looking and talking about like cost of acquisition. Like, hey, hygienist, every new patient that comes and sits in your chair, we spend a hundred and on average 140 bucks for them to sit there. So we're gonna produce, yep. you know, somewhere between 140 and 200 bucks on this first visit. So we're like barely profitable. So like, even though I know you're doing the work as a business, we're not really making money until they keep coming back. So one of the big focuses for us is making sure that our hygiene reappointment with new sp patients specifically is like exceptional. We want that to be like 70, 75% or 80%. Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden the hygienist is like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, totally makes sense now. Like we can't afford <laughs> to see these new patients and have them just walk out the door and never come back um, because we're, you know, we won't be making money as a business. And then therefore, you know, my ability to ask for raises and advance myself are diminished, right? Because we're not being profitable. So right. I think I agree with you. The more people can kind of understand those those workings of how things play, 
uh, the better within the business for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to something very simple. We don't know what we don't know. Yep. So we want to find out that information. Um, in our group, we we went ahead and partnered with uh, with a with a marketing group that, and we specifically were looking for a quote unquote partner because mm -hmm. we don't have a marketing manager. Uh, you were right about how we how we view growth in our in our group, and that is we're trying to do it very smartly, right? Yeah. And and keep an eye on our expenses and and grow our EBITDA, you know. But um, so we wanted to to if we're going to invest in marketing, I would we would rather invest in someone who's a company that's going to be a partner with us. Mm -hmm. And and now our admin teams, they're the ones that look at the dashboards. You know, mm -hmm. they're the ones that work the active lead list. They're the ones that are even in our reviews. Um, they're the ones that are messaging back those people. So they they definitely are involved in that versus say management taking a look at it and just giving off, okay, we had 35 new patients this month. You know, mm -hmm. so it's being transparent with your team and sharing those those growth goals. And and you know what? Each team has really strong team members who are really, really devoted and loyal. And they want the office to do, to do well. Mm -hmm. So having a mindset, I'm big on feedback, Steve. I'm huge on feedback, meaning I don't have all the solutions. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a consultant, but I never go in with, with a, a mindset of, I know all the answers. I think consultants should be great at listening, getting feedback, um, being out in the industry to, to, you know, to talk with people and have resources, um, no fundamentals of operations. But when you get a team that's giving you feedback and solutions, that that growth is going to be happening at a very step, you know, steady level. Yep. Yeah, especially, you know, just the way that facilitates buy-in from the team. If they're being told what to do versus they are helping contribute to the plan of what we're going to do. There's huge, huge difference in adoption of that plan and execution. So a hundred percent agree with that. Now let's talk, Craig, Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure that I get this in there because I'm personally interested and I think <laughs> folks will be interested in this. There's something, you know, unique that you guys are doing that I think is worth people considering. I don't know that it's for every practice, but one of the things mm -hmm. that I know that you have some expertise in is as we look at a, at a dental practice, you know, there's several different strategies people are taking when it comes to specialty work. You know, so some are referring that business out. Some are becoming, you know, I think what we've termed the super GP and they're trying to do as much specialist work as possible. And one of the things that you guys do is look at the option of bringing a specialist into the business part time. And the way, talk to us about like how that works, the way you look at that revenue, because I think it's really interesting. I think it's a, a great like, low risk way to improve some production, improve like the patient's experience. They don't have to like travel to a bunch of different businesses. They can get the quality work done still in your practice, but with the help of a specialist coming in. So talk a little bit about the way you guys operate that, the way you think about it and that relationship. Cause I think it's very interesting. Yeah. I would say the first thing is, is really about the patient. Uh, the feedback is phenomenal on patients. If they do need specialty work, and let's just start with, you know, we've always started with an endodontist. Okay. Yeah. So let's use that as an example. Um, you know, not having to go to another office office and reestablish, even from doing like new patient paperwork. Okay. Mm -hmm. But knowing they're going to be working with a team that they're comfortable with. The feedback that we get always is, it, it's just a great and, and better experience for the patient. Yep. Okay. And Right. Now, as far as for the practice, having that service available is huge. It promotes other things, obviously. Uh, Revenue-wise, sure, it's great. It's almost like passive revenue, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not, you know, the the doctor owner who's the sole provider, you know, that way doing all the work. Now, there are some doctors who will do some endo, but we do have a super GP office in our group, um, and we have specialists that are from, you know, periodontists that place implants, do advanced perio endodontist, orthodontist, prosthodontist. Um, so we have all of that in this one practice. And they're there, some of them only one day a month. Uh, I think we do implants twice a month. And it it just works out great. The, the patients are are just really happy that we have that there. But I recommend, I'm working with, a, you know, a, a, not only a client, but a good friend of mine. And we're, we're looking at that in Denver right now. Um, but there's there's some there's some things that have to be in place. You got to have the room. 
That's right. You have to have 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 operatory space and capacity. There might be some equipment that's needed to be there for the provider and the procedures they're completing. Right. Um, Having staff, qualified staff, especially assistants. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they need to be educated and so forth and have the skills to be able to do that. Okay. Um, And and the last thing, obviously, is finding the right specialist for your practice. So interviewing them. just like you would any employee because they represent your office. Mm-hmm. So we have obviously a whole list of core values and a core focus that we want anyone working with us or being related, you know, to, to Mountainside Dental Group that this is what they want to adhere to. And luckily, you know, our specialists are, they're awesome. And our mm-hmm. patients really like them. They love the experience um, and the staff loves, loves having them there, you know, so it's, it's something to look at. Again, it's not for every practice, but it is definitely something that is going to impact y- your patient experience. Even patient retention, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. goes up. Yeah, which that makes a lot of sense to me, right? Like if you send someone out of the, out of the business, you lose a lot of control and experience and what happens there. And for all you know, they might go and get some treatment done and they didn't like the experience. And then that taints your reputation and then, you might not see them again, where if they're in the business, you get to see and experience what happens. So I think intuitively, that makes a lot of sense that retention is improved with that. Now, Craig, we're coming up against time. The question we always, this has been awesome. Like I I could keep chatting for a long time. Um, we, we always ask the question, what does growth in dentistry mean to you to wrap it up? Uh, it, it comes down to what I said before is, is get a good idea and understanding of how your practice is doing in the key areas okay mm-hmm. and and focus in on the on the on the things initiatives that are, that are going to grow your practice it's not going to be just new patients it's not going to be just adding staff it may be adding you know hygiene capacity right but if you don't have the the data to at least give you an idea of where those growth opportunities are then you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's where we want to start. And, and if I am going to give a plug to DI with their growth reports, every year I do growth reports for my clients in every single office. And, you know, I would say, Steve, that maybe half of that, you're looking at that saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job. Mm-hmm. But then there's ones, oh my gosh, look at this. Look at this hygiene reappointment. Uh, our group just found out that we are really, really low in fluoride percentage, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. we're like, well, okay, that doesn't sound like much, but with four offices, and and how much a year really yeah that that does add up all kinds of little things so Mm -hmm. get a good picture a snapshot of of your practice and every practice is going to be different there's going to be growth opportunities in different areas right but if you don't if if you're if you don't have that knowledge of exactly how you're doing if you don't have that uh what do you want to call it a checkup or your own your own practice exam if you will Mm -hmm. then don't know in what direction that you can go. And that that's what I would say to do first. I love that. And all this, like for listeners, the growth report, I'm a huge fan of it as well. Uh, it's it's yeah. free for dental intel customers and people that aren't. So if you want to get one of these, we'll run it for you. Uh, you know, Craig, I don't know if you want to like review that with folks, you know, I'm sure that you like doing those reviews too. So um, what it includes is it's going to have six key categories, like how are we doing in hygiene, restorative, exams, um, what else is on there? Our treatment plans. It even breaks down like it even breaks down like when you present a zero to a thousand dollar treatment va- plan or a ten thousand plus treatment plan. How often are you presenting that? And then what's your case acceptance on those different case sizes? So it's really insightful. Some fee schedule analysis, a benchmark well, sheet has got yeah. a bunch. I mean, there's so much meat in that thing that we'll hook you up with. So, yeah, I mean, it's got the benchmarks. That yeah. that's the important thing. Where are we yeah. against the top ten? Where are we, you know, on the average in the nation mm-hmm. in, in terms of areas? And and that's, it's it's eye-opening. It's very mm-hmm. eye-opening. But that's that's always a good start um, because you don't just want to, you know, just go out there and try to change things and you find out, well, wait, that wasn't the area that needed to be changed. It was this yep. area that needed to be changed or mm-hmm. worked on. So I want to start from the, from the foundation. I love that. Craig, if folks want to reach out to you, connect with you, what's the best way to do that? And we'll add whatever you share in the show notes for folks that are listening. 
you know, email, if you just put my email in there, ctmdent, D-E-N-T, at gmail.com. I am also on LinkedIn. Uh, send me a message. I mean, even if you want to just have a call, that is fine. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, a, a book of clients, but, you know, I, I love helping out people. Um, I love networking with with people and I'm always listening to podcasts, been on a couple. And um, yeah, so if they want to reach out to me just to have a chat, I'm definitely open talking to talk to anybody. Well, th- thanks. We'll throw that in the show notes for those that are listening. You can go and connect with Craig. What a great resource. Thank you for being willing to connect with folks. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been a growth in dentistry podcast where we ask the question, what does growth in dentistry mean to you? My name is Steve Jensen, your host. Thank you, Craig, for joining us. And to everyone, keep growing. We'll see you.